Welcome to Gen Z Hoops. The Gen Z Basketball Coaching and Sports Business Show. On this podcast, you'll learn from professional players, coaches, and executives from all over the world and see the court in a brand new way. And now, joining you courtside, your Gen Z host, John Hartafillis. Hi, Mr. Levy. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Thanks for having me on. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on. It's great to talk to someone in, in such a unique and interesting position. And um, obviously, uh, I've, the only other GM I've had on before is Mr. Tommy Shepard. And I told him I'm telling you that you sit in a, a seat where there's only they're one of 30 of them in the world. And it's something that it, obviously um, it, it, it's fantastic to get the chance to speak to you. So my, my first question is an interesting one. Uh, I kind of want to ask you, uh, taking it all the way back to your time at Stevens Institute of Technology um, and in college and how that prepared you. I went to Stevens for two years um, during my undergrad. Um, studying business technology, and I'm curious to, as to how that experience there or, or, or what you learned that helped prepare you to go into this career into the front office. Yeah, funny enough, I was there for a short amount of time too, a couple of years and studied business technology. So, you know, it's just one of, you know, many stops along the way that prepares you to go out in the world and be successful. You know, I think just having some some skills to take into your first internship so that that can be successful, that, that you, you can use that as a reference point and a recommendation on to the next spot and on the next spot and the next spot. So it's all the foundational skills that you get by, you know, being around people of diverse backgrounds and, you know, having to communicate effectively both via technology and in person. And, and those are the things I think I took the most, not maybe not any individual class per se, but just kind of the life experience of it. That's great. And then from, from, uh, from, from leaving Stevens, where did that kind of take you into your first, your, your first job and how that kind of set you up to where you are today? Yeah. So, you know, like everybody else, I, I kind of graduated right before the big recession there in uh, 2007. So 2008 came along, I was trying to figure out what I was going to do. And so in 2007, I had a choice. I could either go into a mortgage business or I could go into this low level basketball position in, in the CBA called East Kentucky Miners. You know, I just decided at that age, you know, I didn't have a lot of debt, didn't have a lot of responsibilities that I could pack up and move anywhere I wanted to be. If I really wanted to make this my career, I had to take some chances. Um, so I jumped on the opportunity to be a sales and marketing rep with East Kentucky Miners, knowing that there was only about five or six people in the entire organization and that uh, if I really wanted to be involved in, in the basketball side of things that I could just by volunteering. So I sold tickets and sponsorships from nine to five. And then uh, in the evenings and in the mornings, I helped out with the basketball side, whether that was, you know, running the clock in practice, driving the van, helping with laundry, you know, whatever it is that the coach needed, um, you know, coach Kevin Keithley uh, of the team was, was great where, you know, he just kind of threw me things here and there. And, and as I did them well, he allowed me to do more and more. And, and I think he needed the help, but also he wanted to make sure that I was a guy who was willing to do the little things so that I could get to the big things. That's great. And thinking about how that, that role and, and something that most people uh, maybe don't, don't, don't know about that league too much, but how it prepared you to get into, into, into the G League. So what, what did that look like for you after spending a year there, really understanding, like you said, all, all, all the little things, that all those little skills that, that tra then transform into what you're doing now? Um, what, what did that, what, what, how did you um, end up in the G League? What, what did that call look like? What did that moment look like? Um, how did that all happen? Uh, I was going into my second year. We got about halfway through the year in the CBA before um, kind of the team started running out of money around the league. And so we went from 10 teams to four teams. And as the fourth, one of the four teams was folding, they kind of just kind of, you know, ended the league right there in February of 2009. So we kind of got turned loose and didn't have a job. And so I went about doing what most people do, cold calling, cold emailing, uh, trying to, you know, get as many connections and talk to people as I could. And it took me quite a while. I had to work a couple odd jobs, regular jobs. And it wasn't until September of 2010. So, you know, a good 18 months later that um, I got the opportunity to fly out to LA and work Bakersfield Jam open tryout, coach a team, evaluate some talent, meet the coaching staff, you know, no guarantees of anything. And so I did that for the weekend. And then, you know, at the end, I shook Coach uh, Will Boyd's hand and walked out, no job, and thought like, man, I'm going to miss another season. This is, this is going to be rough. 
like two, three weeks later, I got a phone call asking me if I would be interested in being the video coordinator uh, for the Bakersfield Jam that year. Uh, I jumped on the opportunity, didn't really have a lot of video experience, didn't really know what I was getting into, but just knew I wanted a foot in the door and however I could do it, I was willing to do it. So went out there to Bakersfield, drove all the way across the country from New Jersey uh, and spent the next six months working for the Bakersfield Jam learning a whole hell of a lot about basketball and try and realizing that I didn't know the first thing about basketball, even though I thought I did, you know, I was played it, grew up, watched it all the time. But like when you're in front of the computer cutting film with a coach who was the video coordinator for Popovich in San Antonio, and then you're about to show it to the team, you realize like there's people in this world who see basketball a whole lot better than you do. And so I just tried to absorb as much as I could from everyone I was around. And, you know, I was lucky enough that that turned into the first year of a five-year stint uh, in Bakersfield. All that, that time in Bakersfield must have been so uh, invaluable, especially in the video room where so many, so many people that have come on the show have come through. I, I'm just curious, do you know uh, Coach George, Gallinopoulos, and Nelson? They, they both came on the show and they were, yeah, they were uh, yep. both. Uh, Nelson was my roommate the second year I was there. Uh, George was an intern that year um, and, you know, worked with him for three, or three, three years. Um, so, yeah, I know them very well. We affectionately call it the Bakersfield Mafia. You know, between Mike Schmitz at ESPN and John Bryan, who's an assistant coach at in Chicago now, uh, Rod Baker, who's a scout for the 76ers, Danny Mills is, is the director of, uh, I think, college scouting for the 76ers as well. You know, we've got guys playing it all over. George Nelson, uh, Ryan Marchand's a head coach in Vietnam. You know, Josh Twitty is uh, a Division II coach in Ohio. It's just there's – any number of guys from every season have gone on to do really good things in basketball. Um, and I think it's a credit to, you know, the type of organization that we were running there, um, the type of people we brought in that we wanted to make sure that people saw this as a, as a career, not a job. Um, and that really wanted to move forward. You know, they had to do a lot of work and, but they got a lot of great experience and then they got enough recommendations. And then kind of once the ball got rolling where somebody got a job, then it was like, you know, good people are coming out of this organization. And if they're vouching for this person, then, you know, they must be pretty good. So I felt like we developed a nice little reputation uh, from that time at Bakersfield. Of course, and then, uh, during your time at Bakersfield, obviously you, you moved up so many different times and, and, and went from video coordinator to director of player personnel, all the way up to assistant general manager. How, how did that all take place so fast? And, and what's, that, what's it like in, in the G League where everything's already moving so fast for you to also be changing positions so fast? You know, I, I felt lucky in a way that when I got into the G League in 2010, there was only 16 teams, maybe 15 teams. Uh, organizations were a lot smaller back then. And we weren't tied to an NBA team. We were an independent team. We had two local owners there in Bakersfield who were, who were great people. We were just about a hey, winning games and, and finding players. And so when I showed up, my goal was always to be on the front office side of things. So player evaluation, scouting. And when I got there, pretty much everybody else on the team had aspirations to be a coach. So I think the first day I arrived, I had just driven the last three days from Bakersfield, walk in the office, just kind of hoping to get, you know, keys to wherever I was going to be staying that year and, and get settled a little bit. And uh, Will Voy turned to me and said, you ready to get to work? He's like, the draft is yours. It's three weeks away. And that was my responsibility to evaluate every single of the 200, 300 prospects in the draft, rank our board, put our draft board together, do background calls, you name it. Like I just got thrown into the fire day one and it's what I wanted to do. So over the course of the next three or four years, you know, pretty much everybody there wanted to be a coach. So they were more than happy to let me take care of the, the player evaluation part of it provide my opinion because our head coach was also a general manager. So he had final say on everything. Um, but it was my job to bring him ideas, trade ideas, uh, you know, roster ideas, whether to pick up this guy. And every time a player came available, I had to do the same process over again, you know, evaluate the film, call his college coaches, do a little digging on the internet, try to figure out, you know, if he'd ever been in trouble or whatever else, kind of put together a profile and then, Within 48 hours, I had to make a recommendation to our head coach, like either, hey, we want this guy or we don't want this guy, and here's my reasons why. 
I love that. And, and being someone that's currently at, tw at 20 years old, coaching at the high school level and, and kind of experiencing that, I still do see myself gravitating towards that, that front office uh, lifestyle. So I, I definitely could see how, the, how exciting that would be for you to, to get that experience of, hey, the draft is yours. Like, look, show, show, show us what you got and just being thrown into that fire. And then obviously from, from there, going over to Fort Wayne, where you, where you currently are as the general manager, that's, a, that's obviously a huge transition and, and now being given the keys actually to be the caretaker of a team and saying, okay, now, now, instead of supporting someone and making the decision, now you're making the decision. How, how did that go for you? And, and, and that's obviously a huge transition. What was that, what was that like? Yeah, I mean, there was probably a, a, a nice little step in between for me. So uh, after my four, four years of my five years in Bakersfield, Phoenix Suns came in and, and more or less purchased the team uh, and developed a one-to-one -one affiliate. And uh, Bubba Burridge took over as general manager he kept me on. We had a great relationship from the, all the times he was scouting uh, in Bakersfield and, you know, just helped me help them, you know, get through the season and, and what to expect and how to acquire players and what the operational league requirements are. So I kind of got an understanding of going from this independent team that just was about winning games and, and doing things that the local owner wanted to a one-to-one -one affiliate where, you know, they're bigger aspirations and goals, you know, organizationally as to how can you help the NBA team? And so that kind of makes your decision-making process very different. Uh, you're not just talking about the best five players on Florida win a game. You're talking about who needs spot, you know, who needs minutes and what spot and what roles and, and what situations that they can get so that they can maybe be better for the Suns in the future. So I took a lot of that and uh, I took that in when I was, you know, lucky enough to interview for the GM job in Fort Wayne with the Pacers and was able to kind of secure that job and, you know, go in with knowing that it's no longer about ego. You know, you have to find a coach who's not about a you know, win at all costs and I got to worry about my record. No, I mean, the biggest thing you can do in the G League is impact the NBA team in a positive fashion. And so that's developing players developing staff, developing trainers, uh, whatever it is that they need, you know, for the future and trying to find a player that's going to produce for the NBA team at a, you know, whatever million dollar value that only costs the minimum or that only costs $2 million. And that's how you really make your money back in the G league by investing in it is, can you find enough players that make near the league minimum that could produce like a, you know, a guy who makes eight or $10 million and then you do the math there and you're saving your team six, $7 million each time you do that. And I think that's where you find the most value and you can provide the most value for your team. Definitely. And obviously you've done a great job of that and getting high praise from the, the legend himself, Larry Bird. Um, what, what was that like for you when, when, when he came out and said that they um, just had so much high praise for you and being someone, obviously a great basketball mind, but also an even better top 10 top five player of all time. What was it like hearing that? No, it was surreal. You know, he walked into the interview that I was doing with Kevin Pritchard and, and Peter Dinwiddie and introduced himself and you're trying to stay composed and, you know, you got a, a job to try to get, but at the same time, you're shaking Larry Bird's hand and, you know, he's a really, he's a really funny guy. He's a really good guy. He's straightforward and honest. He, you know exactly where you stand with Larry at all times. Uh, and I really appreciated the time that he spent with me and uh, he even came up, you know, that first year that I got hired to our training camp and sat with me for a couple of practices in a row and kind of told me what he was looking for and looking at and uh, just to be able to pick his brain and ask him questions and have his cell phone number. Like, you know, as a little kid, you're like, you can't believe you're texting Larry, Larry Bird, happy birthday, you know, every year, whatever it is. So it, it, it's an awesome experience just to get to know him. But like, yeah, you, you definitely have fanboy moments, even when you've been with him for a couple of years and uh, I'm lucky he's still in, in a uh, consultant capacity for the Pacers. So I do get to see him from time to time. Well, that, that's absolutely fantastic it's to have someone like that, someone, someone like that as, as your mentor and by your side. Um, and I'm also curious, I, I did read the Forbes article about you um, and, and the Fort Wayne Madden's talking about how you do player and personnel decisions, um, basketball operations, logistics, HR, oh, and some finance stuff that's, that's, also, that's also included in there. There's, there's a lot. So how, how do you go, how does it work in the G League in terms of your, the, your team and how you delegate a lot of these jobs and, and, and who, what, what does your team look like and, and who helps you with that as, as the GM? 
Yeah, so, um, you know, our responsibility is to run the entire basketball side of things. We have a team president who's really good. He's got his sales staff. He's got his marketing people, his PR people, and they they get to handle all that off-court stuff. But, you know, our responsibility, and it's, and it's mainly myself and Chris Taylor, who's our assistant GM, who pretty much run the show day-to-day in Fort Wayne. And, you know, like you said, there's a lot more to it than the basketball. I thought, you know, you get to be a general manager and you just get to focus on basketball all the time. You're watching basketball, talking to agents, and that's going to be the majority of your job. And and then I kind of find out that it's maybe 10 to 15% of my job and my time is spent on actual basketball. And there's just always something else happening, something to do, uh, you know, financial decisions and the budget and, and hiring and, and like I said, HR and communicating with the business side about you know, what events we can participate in, what community relations opportunities or public relations opportunity to make sense with our schedule, doing our travel, doing our housing. I couldn't do it all without Chris, but it's definitely, you know, something that really takes up a lot of our time. And we jokingly call ourselves firemen because every day we're inevitably putting out a different fire. Somebody's got an issue with the apartment. Somebody's got a family thing back home. There's a visa issue with this player. You name it, something different comes up and you got to jump in and fight that fire and try to get through the end of the day so that you can you know, wake up tomorrow and start it all over again. I love it. It's either the uh, the Bakersfield Mafia, Fireman. There's always the kind of name for the for the teams <laughs> you've been on. And I, it, it's great to kind of uh, think of it that way. Definitely, definitely a lot of fun. Obviously, with all those different different uh, people that are a part of your team that are all working together to kind of put out these fires, there has to be a, a large um, importance placed on communication. Um, when things are happening so fast in the G League, what, what is it like for how, – how, how do you do, the, do your best to make sure you're effectively communicating with everyone on your team? Yeah, I mean, we've got group text for everything, uh, you know, each group and, you know, email and calls. And, you know, you just try to make sure that you're kind of touching base with everybody as often as you can. You know, when it's when it's important, imperative, you know, call the Pacers, fill them in, get their input on something. And then so we can make a decision. Otherwise, maybe it's just, you know, craft a, an email, you know, just kind of laying out what's happening, what's going on. Uh, send it out. You know, we have a two week report that we do with the Pacers where I put together a kind of a comprehensive look at what happened the last two weeks with the Mad Ants and send it off to the higher ups with the Pacers so that everybody's, you know, understanding what's happening. But yeah, communication is is huge. Uh, we're big about laying out expectations to the players, to the staff, uh, to agents, so that everybody knows exactly where we stand at any given time. You know, it's always better when people go in with a clear idea of what's expected, rather than just trying to figure it out on the fly. And you spend this this awkward in between time trying to get acclimated. But you know, we really rely on on truthful and efficient communication to make sure that everyone is on the same page at all times. When looking at kind of maybe the, the way the, the gym position is always something, whether it's in a movie like Moneyball, um, it's always been kind of quoted as, as having the, the most difficult part being whether it's everything related to bad news or cutting players or all the negatives that come along with that. Um, how does that work in the G League? Is that something that um, you as the GM um, have to handle in, in the way that it's kind of showed in the movies? Or in, in the G League, is it something where it's more of a coach's thing or, or something like that? How does that work? No, it's definitely an executive uh, deal. We every year we bring seventeen guys to training camp, and only and only twelve are going to make our team. Um, so we got to cut at least five guys, you know, right at the beginning of every season. And then over the course of the year, you've got to make trades and you got to make you know pickups and, and and subtractions from your team. And that's just kind of the nature of the beast. It's unpleasant for everyone involved. You know, I don't. Uh, it it kind of tears you up a little bit. You know, when that cut day is coming in training camp, you feel a little queasy all day because you, you know, you're going to be kind of slashing dreams on some of these guys, and some of these guys will will move on and catch on with other teams or other leagues around the world, and continue their careers. But um, there's going to be a couple guys here and there who probably don't play again, um, and you know, this will be the last thing that they kind of experience in their professional basketball careers, and. You hate to do it. We try to make it quick, uh, not quite as quick as Moneyball made it, but try to give some feedback of why, you know, the decision was made, what we feel they can work on and, you know, wish them luck in the future. And, and you kind of, you know, go from there. But, you know, you definitely don't want to make it about you um, as, as crappy as it is to do it. You know, it's a, it's a moment in their lives, which is going to be really tough. 
you try to just be direct you try to be honest and and let them have some information that they can process later and hopefully use it to their advantage to catch on somewhere else a uh, very well put in terms of of how one of the most difficult parts of the job is, is done and then wrapping things up in terms of uh, the culture that's instilled there in, in Bakersfield, uh, the Pacers ha- have a motto of the three T's, trust, togetherness, and toughness. Um, how, does that, you know, how does that culture go from the NBA team and the Pacers and trickle down into everything you, you do with the Mad Ants? Yeah, um, you know, that was the brainchild of, of Kevin Pritchard and Shabby Cannon, and they wanted that to permeate the entire organization. So it was just important for myself, our head coach, Uh, our trainers, everyone to kind of understand first what it is. So we do 3T training every preseason and go through what the 3Ts are, uh, what the, you know, maybe this year specific goals uh, of 3T are going to be, you know, make sure the staff really understands it. And then when the players come in, we have an individual 3T meeting with them. We go over what 3T means. We go over expectations of how they're going to conduct themselves on and off the court what the potential consequences would be if they don't want to do that. And then we make sure, you know, over the course of the season that we're reinforcing that there's all, there's three T everywhere in our facilities, uh, three T signs and logos, and it's on our players uh, locker placards. It's on their, you know, hats and t-shirts that we give them from time to time. You know, they got water bottles with three T logos on it. They've got, you know, everything. We just try to make sure it's present in front of mind. And then when, Things come up, which, you know, maybe somebody does something that's not 3T. We need to make sure there's clear consequences for those actions so that other people can see that we're not just talking about it, that we actually want to walk the walk with it. Um, And it's led to people no longer being with the organization. Um, But, you know, we have to back up what we say is important to us. And, uh, you know, it's uh, something that's going to flow from the top down always. And, I feel like it's done a a really good job, uh, you know, with something that KP and Chad have kind of created from scratch just a few years ago. I think everyone in our organization knows what it means, knows what we're about. Um, And I think even outside the organization, they understand. Definitely, definitely, and it's definitely something that per, that uh, is, is just so well known, and so it's such a trademark of the Pacers organization. And it's great to know that it's that that both teams are that both teams and organization are able to work together hand in hand in, in getting that message across. Thinking about some of the guys that you've seen, whether it's getting called up, making it to the next level, and and seeing that that for that for them, who are some of those guys in the in the league now that that, that came through Fort Wayne that you're really excited for and, and seeing how they're how they've been playing so far. Yeah, I mean, we've had, you know, a number of guys get call-ups 10 days, two ways. Um, and it's always great to see each individual person. It's kind of hard to say just one. It's kind of like your kids. You know, you put a lot of time and effort and energy into these guys. And, you know, it's to me, it's no different, you know, if a guy gets a 10-day and gets into an NBA game than if he signs a multi-year contract because it's the realization of that dream that all these guys have. So, you know, we're, we're always excited about – each one, you know, if I had to single out a couple, you know, Edmund Sumner was on a two-way with us after, you know, tearing his ACL in college and rehabbed with us and didn't play for the first half of the year. And then, you know, started to play in the second half, came back the next year, was really good for us, got converted to an NBA contract and signed a multi-year deal with the Pacers. So we're really excited about, you know, his development. And But there's other guys too, you know, the Jared Utoffs and the Ben Moores and Alex Poitras and... Some of those guys are overseas now. Some of those guys are still, you know, kind of in the G League or the NBA. But it's always great to just to see each different guy, you know, achieve their dreams. A great example was uh, Jordan Lloyd, who uh, was a, you know, undersized two guard at University of uh, Indianapolis Division II program in college. Uh, We drafted him in the third round of the G League draft. And then he goes on, you know, to, to be our starting point guard for at the end of the year. Uh, go overseas, come back, sign a two-way, and win, win a championship with the uh, Toronto Raptors. So, you know, it, it's just great to see the development uh, part of things. And, and that goes all the way back to Bakersfield as well. You know, the Jarrell McNeils and the Trey Johnsons and the, a lot of the guys that we had back in the day that, you know, achieved a lot. Uh, Elijah Millsap is another guy who, you know, was like five or six years in the G League before he finally got called up to Utah. And then he's, you know, playing in the playoffs. So it's just, it's, it's absolute awesome to see these guys achieve. And, and the same thing on the staff side, you know, we've got 
uh, staffers that have gone up, a strength coach who's now with the Pacers, and uh, Harrison Greenberg, who's a scout for the for the Pacers as well. So, you know, helping anybody achieve their dream is, is awesome. And I feel bad that I mentioned some and not others, but at the same time, it's just, uh, it, it's just, it's awesome to look back and think about some of the people you've been around and how successful they've become. Definitely awesome to see all these uh, players that, that, you know, you went through the struggle with and people kind of just say, oh, okay, two, three years. And then you kind of just forget it. Think about all the days and, 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 and weeks and months that you spent um, trying to trying to get to get to that level, and 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 they did, and it's it's awesome to see that. Um, now with, with this season, obviously the G League is going is gonna about you guys are about to start a, sh- a shortened season in the next few weeks. So obviously, that it, it, very few people get called up after one big game or two good games. It takes time to to get that call up. How difficult does the shortened season make that? And who do you think um, are you are you excited for that still has a chance at making that happen? Yeah, well, I mean, we're definitely excited, but I don't think anybody quite understands what this is going to look like um, yet. You know, obviously, in, in the time of COVID with quarantine restrictions and, and the testing protocols, we don't know how that's going to impact call-ups. You know, it, is it going to be harder to get called up or is it going to be easier because teams might need bodies if they have an outbreak on their team or, or whatever? So uh, this is going to be as unique a season as, you know, I've ever been a part of. And I remember the, the lockout season in 2011 in the G League where we started and the NBA wasn't playing yet. So I think this will be even more wild than that. But we'll see. I mean, they, the G League's taken as many precautions as they can to get us down here in Orlando and allow us to play these games and get these development opportunities for our players. 15 games doesn't sound like a lot, but when you consider that some of our players haven't played since March of last year and, you know, they might not get a chance to play significant minutes again until the start of next season, whenever that is. So, you know, if, if we can provide that opportunity for a guy to get a couple hundred minutes that they otherwise wouldn't have got in the span of 20 months, um, you know, we wanted to jump all over it and come down here and be competitive, but also, you know, allow, allow a lot of our guys and a lot of the Pacer guys to play. Can't wait to see um, how, how it all works out. And obviously, we're look, really looking forward to, to seeing a, 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 a many, many more cops from the, from the Mad Ants over the next few, whether it's this season, next season, um, however, 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 whenever that, that happens. So, Mr. Levy, thank you so much for coming on. It, it, whenever I have a jam on the show, it always just, I'm just always a little bit I'm extra locked in just because <laughs> it, it starts so exciting to me. Just, just a little bit. I, I, obviously, I love, all, I love all my guests, just like, just like uh, the same thing you said about the kids. But thank you sure. so much for coming on. And I, I really can't wait to, to listen to this over again and, and take all these lessons and, and hopefully use them too. I appreciate you having me and uh, wish everybody the best of luck and stay safe. Thanks for listening to Gen Z Hoops. Make sure to follow, like, and subscribe on Instagram, LinkedIn, and all major social media platforms at Gen Z Hoops. You can tune in and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and every other podcast platform on the planet. Get ready for the next episode.